So thank you everyone so much for being here. I'm excited to uh, present some of our work here at UConn on the field implementation of UHPC beam end repairs on steel girder bridges in Connecticut. So I'm going to start off with just some background on the repair, some previous research that got us to the point of field implementations. And then I'll provide an overview of the two different implementations that I'll be discussing of the two bridges. One is a full height repair and one is a partial height repair. So this gives a really great overview of how flexible this repair can be and hopefully give everyone some ideas about how it can be implemented on other steel bridges with corrosion damage. I'll move on to then some key findings so far and some acknowledgements. Wanted to start off discussing why we are using this repair in the first place. What is the real problem that we're solving? And that is the extensive corrosion on beams that occurs beneath leaking joints, uh, particularly in the Northeast. This is a huge problem. We have a lot of steel girder bridges, simple spans, and that corrosion damage can significantly reduce the bearing capacity. This is something that needs to be repaired for safety of the traveling public. And it is immensely costly. Throughout the US, we spend over $8.3 billion a year to repair or replace corrosion damaged bridges. So out of that need came this UHPC beam end repair. And what we do, um, Kai, can you see my pointer OK? Yes. Yes, yeah, OK. okay. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, when we have a beam with corrosion damage, we can weld headed shear studs, typically used for making a girder's composite with decks, to the web, the intact portion of the web. And we can bypass this corroded, corroded region completely. We can then encase that beam end in ultra high performance concrete and bypass the corroded region, this UHPC block then protects the beam end that is corroded and it serves as an alternate load path for those bearing forces. To go over some of the previous research, yeah, phase one of the project started back in 2013. And this was to show the proof of concept of the UHPC repair. Experiments were conducted on third scale rolled beams and that followed up with finite element models to identify design parameters. How would we determine the number of studs that were needed? Where should the studs be located? And that led us to phase two, which was focused on the stud capacity for shear studs welded to thin plates in UHPC. That's another big difference that we had to consider rather than that thick top flange, we're talking about a thinner web. So what is that capacity of the stud in the UHPC material? And that led to full scale experimental analysis on plate girders. After those two rounds of research, we moved on to phase three, where we are looking at field implementations on heavily trafficked highway bridges in, in Connecticut, providing instrumentation and monitoring. And these projects have helped extend that to additional states that is now being used across the country and is part of the current Everyday Counts initiative. So to give some background on the differences between the two bridges that I'll be showing some pictures of for the first implementation, this happened back in between 2019 and 2020, we were casting during the winter months. This was a rolled beam bridge built in 1965. There was corrosion along the full height of the bearing column and this required a full height repair to fit the number of shear studs that were required. This was plain carbon steel. Uh, we're casting through the top of the deck, so pouring through the deck and casting through. And this project was a consultant-led design. For the second implementation, we were working on a plate girder bridge built in 1983. This only required a partial height repair, and it was on a weathering steel bridge. This casting actually just occurred last week. So uh, Wednesday and Thursday of last week. So I'm happy to be able to share the most up-to-date information on this. And we could cast from below deck which severely um, 
limited the number of lane closures that were required, being able to implement this repair without causing delays to the traveling public is another huge benefit. And this project was led by the Connecticut DOT, their in-house design groups. We see a lot of different differences between these two implementations. The first implementation was in New Haven, Connecticut. There were 45 beam ends that were repaired. There were ranging skews from 25 to 35 degrees. There were different rolled beams. So the beam depths varied, the end conditions varied. Some had bearing stiffeners, some did not. We were also working over rail lines. So anytime working with high-speed Amtrak, access is going to be challenging. So this is a great first test of the flexibility of the repair. I started off with a mock-up. A mock-up uh, was done on both implementations. I'll show pictures of both. I can't stress this enough how helpful this was. Uh, the contractor had previously not worked with UHPC material. For those of us had, who do work with it, we know it's, it's a different animal, a lot of different considerations, particularly for the formwork and the casting procedures. So if you're thinking about implementing a UHPC project um, and the contractors in your state are not that comfortable with it, I, or it's a new application, can't stress enough how helpful the mock-up is. So we had our steel beam specimen. Um, we just had our plywood formwork in this PVC distribution pipe casting system. This plywood form on the top simulated the deck. And the real benefit of this mock-up was making sure the casting procedure was working correctly. We had no issues with casting. A lot of lessons learned for the contractor going out in the field. Um, and then we were ready to get things going. We first started off with stud welding. And we had some issues with the weld quality in some locations. We wanted to make sure we had that full weld collar at the top of the stud, um, this nice complete weld collar. That's what our research was based on. That's what the stud capacities that we're using is based on. So we were able to go back with the contractor. If there were any issues with the weld collar quality, we could either touch those up or add additional studs. After studs were welded, we installed our monitoring equipment. We had accelerometers, strain gauges, um, temperature transducers, and this was all housed on top of the pier cap in a NEMA enclosure box. Then came forming, so they had to fit the formwork and then seal it. There were vent holes at the top, and this PVC distribution system, um, making sure that that was tight, coring through the deck holes. Uh, and throughout testing, we used a boroscope in some locations to make sure they were filling evenly and in other spots, just tapping the forms, being able to see it and then plugging the vent holes when the UHPC filled the top. For mixing and casting, mixing occurred on the top of the deck through those core holes. The inverted traffic cone uh, was an excellent uh, plan by the contractor. It, it worked very well. So we would cast in the mixer on top. They had two mixers running, fill into just five gallon buckets and dump into the inverted traffic cones. We can see afterwards, we have the cured beam ends. These are two different locations, whether they had the bearing stiffeners present or did not have bearing stiffeners present. And that project was completed a year and a half ago. And so far there have been no issues. Looking at the data collected, what we wanted to make sure we were seeing is that the web strain that we recorded prior to repair, the number of high magnitude web strain events was decreasing after we installed the repair. We did find that. And another just graph showing we had strains on the web studs and embedded within the UHPC. We want to make sure that those studs are engaged. So being able to see the strains on the studs as well as in that UHPC channel. UHPC panel that tells us that the repair is working. For our second implementation, and I'm sorry, this is the type of, it was in East Hartford, Connecticut, not East Haven. We reported 49 beam ends. This was over 12 spans. This bridge had both simple and continuous spans. Um, of course, most of the locations that required repair were those right underneath a joint and all the ends were repaired within two days. For the mock-up here, we have the same thing. Step one was our surface prep and welding, but this was weathering steel, so it was really important for the weld quality that we got to that clear, shiny steel underneath the weathering steel layer, then forming to be watertight. For a partial height repair, the forming is much easier. For our stud welding, 
This repair was different than the first in the design. We see that we have these additional studs welded to the bottom flange. Um, these were not just to hold the UHPC panel in place. This was actually to help address concerns. We had a lot of corrosion along the bottom of the web, along the bottom flange. So there were some concerns with the interface shear. So we included studs along the bottom flange and we had two standard designs based on the severity of that corrosion. Some had two rows of these flange studs, some, some had one row, and we're actually doing currently more experimental tests on the performance of this combined shear studs on the web and flange. For monitoring, we improved our sensor placement and number of sensors based on learnings from the previous implementation. We don't have any monitoring data to show yet as we're still in the curing phase. And since this is a partial height repair, afterwards, after the formwork's removed, we're going to be able to install additional sensors to monitor that panel slip. And this is going to be a direct correlation to what we've done in some of our lab studies. For forming, as I mentioned, partial height much more simple forming. We did have to drill a hole through the web to clamp the form from the back. Uh, that wasn't a concern in terms of the structural performance, but wanted to just make sure that we had no issues and we didn't want to use stud ties or anything to impact the performance of the UHPC. We had our mixing. You can see the mixer used for this implementation was different than the first. That's just based on the UHPC material. Both jobs use different UHPC mixes. In the casting from below deck, we'd be able to fill those same buckets, used a lift, brought them up, and just dumped them in right over the side. This went much faster than casting from above the top of the deck, Much, many fewer steps involved. So if that's an option for your application, a partial height repair is has a lot of benefits. So some key learnings, this novel repair procedure was implemented on two bridges in Connecticut. The mock-up is critical to the overall success. You want to make sure the owner, contractor, and inspector are all on board with the quality of the weld collar and understanding how this application is different compared to something where you're making a deck composite. Uh, the two repairs use the different designs, different design processes. The UHPC mixes were different. Casting procedures were different. So this is a really flexible repair. Um, and being able to be involved with the research team during design and construction, we had a really smooth transition from research to practice. Just want to thank um, our research project, of course, all our partners at Connecticut DOT, uh, their research unit, as well as those in design and inspection helping us out in the field, as well as the contractors and designers on both of the projects. And with that, I will take any questions if I have any, or I can do that in the Q&A. Thank you, Alexi. A big round of applause to you as well, and to you. Uh, very interesting to see the application of UHPC in those uh, steel girder and repairs. Uh, a lot of visuals are um, great, and I hope uh, and I wish you best of success for other projects to come. There is a question here uh, asking whether the bridge were kept fully open during uh, for traffic during the period. period. That's, that's a great question. For the second repair where we were doing par partial height, the bridge was fully open to traffic the, the full time. For the full height repairs, we had partial lane closures just over the beams that we were casting as soon as we were done casting that was open back up to traffic. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then there's one general question. What is the reason to use UHPC repair strengthening or to protect steel beam? Why are you doing that? That's a great question. And this is something that it, it might not be the right fit for every application, but the main goal here is to give DOTs another option, another tool in their tool belt to address the problem with corrosion damage beam ends. UHPC is essentially impermeable. We get an incredible structural performance. Uh, we don't get the same results if you use a high strength concrete or anything like that. Um, so just the flexibility of repair when you're able to use it. And I'm happy to dive into that any other time. Um, if that didn't fully answer your question, I can try again in the Q&A. No, this is, this is good, Lexi, thanks. And one of the reasons is what you couldn't cover here yet, because this is already the third implementation, is the, uh, the gaining the strength, the strength of the girders, right? So after corrosion of certain section, 
you maybe lose a capacity down to 30% or so, and just with the UHPC repair, the previous results could show that you can regain 100% of the global capacity, right? So this is, this is huge in terms of uh, not having to take down the bridge and build a new one. Uh, not sure how long the lifespan can be ex expanded, right? Because maybe some other items will, will fail, but you are aiming at least another 10, 20 years from now, right? Yes, uh, it's likely that there's going to be another area of the bridge that fails <laughs> before this UHPC end encasement. Yeah, and there's uh, one quick question. Uh, what standard you followed for designing the shear studs? That's a great question. As part of this phase three research project, uh, we actually developed a design guide for the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Um, when we're talking about the shear stud capacity, that was performed by a previous PhD student of both Dr. Riley and Dr. Zaghi um, that focused on the push-off test in order to get the capacity. But I'd be happy to direct you to anyone at the Connecticut DOT for the um, repair guide that we developed.